scientific information and analysis, he was in charge of interacting with the, with the government officials. So, so your job would be backing up facts about um, effects of metal yes. on, uh, could it be on, on the environment, yes. on people? Yes, could be birds and bees and bunny okay. rabbits, uh, fish, uh, or it could be human beings, the population, or it could be our own working population. population yeah. uh, because, because nickel is such a, a um, ubiquitous metal in society now, even our coinage is, has a tremendous amount of nickel in it, um, people contact nickel. And there are all kinds of, of, of assertions made by some well-intentioned people but not informed people. Um, there was uh, an action when I was vice president in Europe. The uh, European country uh, nominated to Europe that they would ban the use of stainless steel in hospitals and food processing because stainless steel contained nickel and chromium. And nickel, some forms of nickel, important, some forms of nickel are carcinogenic, some forms are not carcinogenic by very sophisticated testing. Um, some forms of chromium are carcinogenic. Chromium-6 in the environment is a bad actor. So these people in Europe had heard chromium-6 is a bad actor, and Ni3S2, a nickel sulfide, is a bad actor. So stainless steel must be a bad actor times two because it's got both of these things in it. But both of these things in stainless steel are in the elemental form. And they have much, much different toxicological properties in the elemental form. And so I was sent over to Europe to talk to the European regulators and politicians who were interested in protecting the population. But I convinced them that if they were successful in outlawing the use of stainless steel in hospitals and food processing, they would create an epidemic of unknown proportion uh, because they would lose the ability to clean things in stainless steel, uh, scalpels and, and scissors and everything in a hospital is stainless steel. Yeah, yeah. And it's mm -hmm. autoclaved at very high temperatures. Why can it go to high temperatures? It's because it's stainless steel. It doesn't stain, it doesn't corrode, it doesn't um, crumble. Um, it retains its strength and, and, and clean properties. Why does um, a food processing industry use stainless steel? It can be cleaned. And one of the things you don't want in food processing is bacteria to get in and contaminate your food. Uh, what do you see the first thing you walk into a McDonald's kitchen? You see stainless steel all over the place. Why? Because they can rub it down with corrosive um, uh, cleaning agents and it won't. That's why it's not all wood. <laughs> it, it, well, what they were claiming was that porcelain was better. I convinced them by study that porcelain was had huge horrendous pores that could trap uh, bacteria. Porcelain cannot be cleaned, wood cannot be cleaned, stainless steel can. Fortunately, the, the European Union pulled out of that. They, they said, okay, we... We, we exaggerated. We, <laughs> no, they were well-intentioned, you know, but yeah. they were just chemically ill-informed. But at one meeting there, I said to one of the regulators, Please bring in any university chemistry professor that you wish anywhere in the European Union to the next meeting, which is going to be on something, you know, several months later. And I will speak to him about this and you can check with him. And they did. They brought in two professors, one from the UK and one from Belgium. And uh, at one point in the meeting, I was making a statement and one of the regulators said, to his, to his compatriot, uh, professor, 
is he right on that? And the chemistry professor, yes, he is. And I said, oh, oh, well, you know, that, that sort of evaporates our, our case right there, you know. So it, there's no, there's, there always is some risk of disagreement among scientists because science is not 100 percent, you know. No, and, and uh, that's how you advance too. Yeah, that's, that's how, often you, how yes, you make yes. breakthroughs. But you make test after test after test, and then when the tests are incontrovertible, you, you're, they're laws of, of, of physics, or laws of chemistry, laws of thermodynamics. But if you don't have laws, then you say the, the uh, understanding that we have, uh, at least 98% of us have, is that this is what will happen if you, if you do something. And you don't get any disagreement on that. One or two weird scientists may disagree with it, like is happening with climate change. Yeah, I was going to say global warming. But, but uh, you know, global warming is clearly happening, and there's a chemical reason for it. So the press oftentimes um, is, is not the best friend. The press is interested in selling newspapers or selling television or radio. And they're most interested, I've had press tell me, in debate. As if they can make a fight out of something, it's interesting. And people will watch it. If everybody agrees, it's uninteresting. It's, it's not news. And so they tend to say, they find somebody who says, nickel is a carcinogen. And then they interview that person, and they come over and interview me, and they, they make it out to be uh, a, a, a debate, which, in fact, it is not yeah. among, you know, 98% of, the, of the, the chemists. But the population is influenced a great deal by the media. I was, I, this is actually a question I, I ask often, is, is if you think there's a... Uh, a big disconnect between a lot of the natural resource world and the rest of the world. So people, media, who often, um, who often exactly take one story or one case, or even are just ill-informed. Inf Ill Abs um, absolutely. And Will. then you, you, you simply have the public which is misinformed or just doesn't know enough. Or the public thinks they are being damaged. Yeah, And if somebody thinks they or their children are being damaged, they can get very emotional about it. So their brain turns off and they're very emotional. And I've been in public meetings because I was responsible. One of the legacy issues that Inco had uh, was in, in Port Colburn. Uh, Port Colburn the plant in Port Colburn, the nickel refinery, was built in 1918. And it was built in Port Colburn and not in Copper Cliff because Port Colburn was located on Lake Erie. And it was right after the First World War. And the government, the Allies, and the government of Canada put pressure on INCO to site a refinery to produce nickel, which was used in armaments in, in high anti-piercing armaments, and to locate it on easy shipping, particularly into the United States and into Europe. So we built it in Port Colburn. There's no nickel in Port Colburn. It had to be shipped from Copper Cliff. And during the early years, the unloading of the nickel that we did ship and the way in which we refined the nickel caused quite a bit of dust. And the dust went up the stack and floated with revealing winds and then came down on land. A lot of residential land and a lot of farmland in Port Colburn. And the ministry which oftentimes is their own worst enemy, but uh, 
the ministry knows I think this, so the fact <laughs> that I say it is not. Uh, the ministry is, 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 is caught between a rock and a hard place. I wouldn't want to do their particular job, but sometimes they make statements without recognizing what kind of inflammation they're, they're going to cause the population. And that was something they did in Port Colburn. And, and uh, then a, a uh, lawyer in, Port Col in uh, Toronto uh, heard me stand up and say that, yes, the, nic the high levels of nickel, copper, and cobalt in soils in Port Colburn was caused by INCO's operations. Oh, he said, Vice President, standing up and admitting that it comes from INCO, it's a slam dunk, class action. So they filed a $760 million class action lawsuit against INCO and uh, named the ministry and the, um, uh, let's see, well, everybody settled um, except for INCO. And the lawyers at INCO came to me and said, what's the truth of this? Is there any risk? And I said, the risk, I believe, is very, very small. But we should do a risk assessment, which is a scientific methodology to not only assess the risk to the human population, but to environmental and bushes and trees and deer and pets and what have you. And uh, they said, how long is it going to take? I said, uh, probably four years. How much is it going to cost? It's going to cost millions of dollars. Well, it's been 20 years and about $25 million. And it still isn't, uh, the class action is settled but the ministry has still not signed off on the action that INCO wants to take to, um, to ameliorate some of the crop risks. But we were in court with the class action and uh, it had to be appealed and finally it came down that um, there was no, um, yes. the, the thing that people were claiming it, was, it wasn't about health risk, it was about property values. Because of the metal in the soil, the property values they asserted had gone down. Um, first of all, it was the class, class action lawyer himself who, if there was any diminution of property value, he caused it by so, making yeah. all kinds of inflammatory and incorrect statements. But in fact, the, the evidence showed there was no diminution of property value in Port Colburn relative to Welland, where, which is a similar kind of demographic community without nickel and copper and cobalt. Anyway, that, the legacy of, of uh, the metals in the soil still confronts us today. Uh, we are going to uh, ameliorate the, the crop, the, any risk to crops, which is, is very minimum, but it, there is some risk to soybeans. Uh, not very many soybeans are grown in Port Colburn, but never mind. Uh, but the, the uh, The thing is that, that I wanted to use hyper-accumulating plants. There are certain plants that became known to me in 1996 that love to accumulate nickel into their biomass. And the reason that these plants do this is because they grew on lateritic uh, soils. Lateritic soils are nickel-rich uh, soils, not terribly rich, 1% nickel in the soils. But these plants 
any, any time in the environment, uh, everybody in the environment is looking for a niche. And if you can crowd somebody else out because you feature something, other plants were being not happy with nickel, and these plants loved nickel, so they took over. And when uh, some people in the United States Department of Agriculture, who I was working with, went and, and uh, harvested some of these uh, plants from Bulgaria and, and places like that and other in Africa, and then they selectively, not genetic engineering, but selectively bred certain property. If, if you found a plant, uh, this, this plant here got a lot of nickel into its biomass, but not very rapidly. And this plant over here didn't bring very much nickel into its biomass, but did it very rapidly. Then what would happen if you selectively bred these plants. And it turned out that on the fifth try of having different genotypes um, selected, you could find lots of nickel and kinetically lots. And so they developed certain uh, genotypes of these nickel hybrid kinetic plants that we tested in Port Colburn soil. Gangbusters, beautiful, wonderful. And I had the dream and the board of directors uh, wanted me to pursue it, to have Inco soak the nickel out of the ground, burn the biomass, and we even tested in, in taking it to Sudbury, one ton of, bio, of, of dust from incineration of the, of the plants. plants, and put it into the converters to recover the nickel. <laughs> And it works. Wow. And so you could suck the nickel up and recover the nickel. It was a, it was a, um, all you do is normal farming. You're farming nickel. Instead of corn, you're farming nickel. Instead and of mining it. <laughs> it. Instead of mining it. And in fact, then the idea was there are certain places in Indonesia uh, that we do not mine because they're not ri it's not rich enough for our smelter. We take a cut off of maybe something like, um, I, I don't know what the cutoff is now, but let's say it's 2.6% or something like that, or 1.8%, I don't know what it is, a nickel. And you leave behind lots of soil that is 1% nickel. Well, these plants love 1% nickel. So what happens if you bring them into Indonesia and plant them as part of the revegetation, as part of the regreening. Then you not only green the countryside, but you also recover more nickel. And also, it's a social boon because subsistent farmers in Indonesia can make more money for their families farming nickel than farming anything else. Yeah, true. And so. There was great interest in the board of directors well, and... Sorry, what would the percentage be in a plant then? If it were on, uh, you said, the cutoff, let's say, is 2% roughly? Oh, but, but what happens is that you, you bring, um, you get 1% um, uh, okay. into the pl plant biomass. But when you incinerate it, it goes it to 15%. Matter, yeah. okay. Then you take that dust and put it in the converter. Yeah, and it costs way less than mining. Anyways. Oh, yes, so, yes, so yes, yes. Yeah. And um, so we actually tested that. One of the issues was these plants are not indigenous to Indonesia. So one of the concerns was, are you going to bring something in, and then it's a weed that takes over and kills everything else. So we did a bunch of testing on that and so forth. That's about the time I retired. <laughs> and. Uh, it hasn't, unfortunately, gone any further. Sad. That's pretty neat. Yeah, it is. What's neat. the name of the plant? Alyssum. Alyssum. Okay. It's a. You can buy certain genotypes for your garden here in Canada. What? Yeah. What does it look like? Is it? It's a beautiful like... plant that has a yellow flower. Okay. So when it it's growing, it's green. Then when it flowers, it's yellow, and then right after it flowers, you you 
you cut it down, you, you actually harvest it with a, uh, like rolling bales of, of alfalfa. Mm -hmm. And um, it regrows. So you could still get ni nickel uh, the next season year. after season. The next year. In Indonesia, you may get three seasons in, in, yeah. in one year because it's a much different yeah. climate. Yeah. These are, I still have a pipe dream of it, but uh, it needs, these kinds of things need a champion to really go after the, um, and there was a, another issue associated with the patent ownership of these genotypes in the United States. And that was causing some concern uh, because it wasn't clear. Um, it was clear to me, but it wasn't clear to the legal minds mm -hmm. um, what exactly was Enko's risk in, in using this. Yeah. Anyway, I'll let you ask another question. Sure, well, um, on the topic that we started with, um, you had mentioned examples like um, the one with the European Union and things like that, was uh, a lot of your role uh, in that position to def um, kind of defend yes. all the time? Or no. were there also parts of uh, your research where you found things like, uh, yes, this is actually in fact uh, bad for our workers, uh, this is how we should change it, things like that? Yeah, or yeah. was it always damage control with no, the public? It, 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 a lot of it was damage control. I have to say that mm -hmm. there are thousands of people who are actively engaged in trying to ruin the mining industry. They, they really think it's evil. And uh, I understand that they're emotionally charged, but they have incorrect facts. So a lot of times I was trying to bring reason, scientific reason. Um, there was a, a Swedish woman who was against um, having any nickel in European coinage because of dermatitis. Well, it, it is true that nickel causes dermatitis. Elemental nickel can cause dermatitis. But it is 100% associated with ear piercing and body piercing, where the contact of the nickel stud, which they used to use in the ear, was in prolonged and intimate contact. Those are two adjectives that are very important. Prolonged contact and intimate contact. And then you can turn on the immune system to react to any other nickel that is, is encounters you in a prolonged and intimate way. Coinage is not handled in a prolonged and intimate way. Well, it turned out I, I, I fought her for two years, and it turned out she was employed by the copper industry in Sweden because the copper industry wanted the coin, or copper in the coins. It was, it was a, an issue of trade uh, uh, and, and not science, but we, we got the European Union to, to agree scientifically that there could be nickel in the, in the coins. But then whether or not they wanted nickel in the coins was another question, which I wasn't, I wasn't interested in foisting nickel on them, but I was interested in defending scientifically nickel's properties. Um, we have had a lot of difficulty with carcinogenicity. Mm -hmm. um, and before I took over, Stuart Warner was very working very hard on this. A lot of research sponsored by not only Inco, but uh, nickel producers all around the world in an organization called NIPIRA, the Nickel Producers Environmental Research Association, which they also do environmental research as well as human health research. There was a fact the fact of the matter was that in Clitic, in Wales, where we had operated in a nickel refinery since 1904, in about 19, 
30-something. The Inco doctor in clinic, Lindsay Morgan, thought there were an awful lot of lung and nasal sinus cancers happening in the workers, in the Inco workers. And he didn't like the size of the number of workers being struck. So he sponsored an epidemiology study. Epidemiology is a word that comes from the same root as epidemic. Epidemics, yeah. It is the study and determinants of disease in the human population. So what you do is you compare a study population, your working population, with as much as you can an identical population in terms of sex and age and calendar year of birth and so forth of a population not exposed to the exposure that you think the study population is. And when he did that, he found there was an extremely high risk relative to what was happening in the Welsh population. So something was happening at clinic. Some compound was loose. And it turned out to be Ni3S2, nickel subsulfide, is a very aggressive lung and nasal sinus carcinogen. We think we know from research now over the past 30 years why and the mechanism by which it uh, causes lung and nasal sinus cancers. Nickel oxide does the same thing to a much lower extent than nickel subsulfide. But both of them are classified as carcinogens. It's a simple step, but incorrect, to say nickel subsulfide, nickel oxide, the common thing is nickel, therefore all nickel must be carcinogenic. So we did all kinds of studies. Nickel powder breathed by animals is not carcinogenic to the animals. When we study human populations of workers in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, the, the um, uh, uranium purification in Oak Ridge uses nickel diffusers, nickel powder diffusers to enrich the uranium. And Inco sold nickel powder into that. So we then went and studied epidemiologically the workers involved in handling that powder. There's no excess of cancer, lung, nasal sinus, nothing. Ingestion, there's no sign of any cancer anywhere else in the body by ingestion. It's only the, the inhalation of these two compounds, nickel sulfate, nickel chloride, nickel nitrate, nickel carbonate, nickel hydroxide.